panelists today are going to be addressing these issues, looking at trends, looking at uh, what's happening out there that ensures that the people who do come, blinded, uh, who do come are uh, prepared and stick around. And with that, we're going to start with Teresa to my left uh, to provide a broad overview um, from the teachers union perspective of what's happening out there and what's needed out there. So while um, the California Teachers Association is um, not unique in the area of discussing um, the teacher shortage or teacher preparation, we are unique in that we bring um, to the table a practitioner perspective to, um, to the issue in that we represent um, pre-service educators um, in universities who are um, working to train the future teachers. Um, we represent and work uh, to uh, support um, teachers as they're in the profession. And we also take great pride in having one of the um, strongest of uh, student teacher networks um, in the state and in the nation. So we kind of bring the perspective of the practitioner in the work. Um, there are several reasons um, that we really feel that this is a, a, a critical problem and some of the things that are actually playing into it. And I bring um, greetings from many of my students who are uh, pre-service teachers who um, talk about the, some things like the teacher shortage being um, one of the reasons being that they don't realize or don't feel that there's going to be job security or job stability. Um, as recent as 2008, we issued 21,000 pink slips to teachers and many times those were issued um, uh, to new teachers. Even now, um, in 2016, when California's budget reserve is at a record level, um, uh, teachers and administrators uh, talk about spending priorities. There's still job security created over uh, staffing decisions. And uh, someone else spoke to the perpetual low wages in comparison to other professions. Um, we, though, um, believe it is, it is important that the teachers union be at the table and have paid very close attention to the issue of teacher quality over the um, last few years. We, for example, we developed first and foremost, and these are all available on our website. I don't have the time to really go through each of the documents. We developed a teacher evaluation framework, which addresses how we keep teachers in the profession and how we develop an evaluation system that is there intended to strengthen the knowledge, the skills, and the practice of practitioners um, to improve student learning. We created the teacher preparation um, report that um, talked about some of the strategies, and I'll share a few with you in a minute, that we feel are important in any teacher prep program. And recently we've become a, uh, developed a conversation on the teacher education pipeline. We strongly believe that the, that the role of teacher preparation does not begin in a fifth year program in a university, nor does it begin in the university in the undergraduate level, but that it's a tra tra trajectory, that is a pipeline that begins as early as high school. And so some of the things that we did in our document, also available on the website, is a build on the foundation of the California standards for the teaching profession. We highlighted the multiple and varied and quality pathways into the teaching profession that are offered by many of our CSUs, our UCs, our institutions of higher education in California. And basically, CTA centers three things in its uh, perspective on what we see in teacher education. One is quality. Two is we want to be able to create a sufficient workforce uh, to provide a quality education. And three, we want a diverse teacher workforce to address the needs of the changing demography in California. And that those need to be situated in a tri-partnership that's created over years of a relationship built on a foundation between K-12 districts, the teachers union, and the universities. Um, in creating these uh, teacher preparation programs. We believe, for example, in the importance of teacher residency models that re reflect that tripartnership. 
that really place at the center of those models the mentorship of a more experienced teacher. We think that we, programs should have early field experience and not strictly in schools or in classroom, but that that early field experience incorporate the communities surrounding the schools so that our students are also relating to the parents and the community organizations that comprise that. We believe in the process of a fair, localized assessment of professional readiness that is there to re-examine and reconstruct the teacher's practices so that they, it informs their teaching practices and it informs the university or the program where they are situated. We think that it's important to really begin to think about re-examining and reconstructing our induction programs so that they reflect the changes in curriculum and in current pedagogy. And then all three of those things occur within the context of this tri-partnership. We are particularly concerned with the low number of students going into the teaching profession who are students of color. Um, and therefore, we've de um, developed a couple of things that, that I'm going to share with you today. One is we have club ed um, in our high schools, and we're beginning to look at our student CTA. We have programs such as the It's a Barrio program at Cal State Northridge, um, our work in San Diego that Lindsay will talk about, our work at Sac State and others. Um, some of the strategies, and then I'll end with this, that we feel are really important. Vastly more clinical experience, more teacher education programs at the undergraduate level of the universities that are working uh, in concert with our, um, our teacher preparation uh, five-year programs or our colleges of education, including those in ethnic studies um, that can help deal with the issue of diversity infusion of cultural responsiveness into the teacher education programs, mentorships across the board, adequate financial support to students and programs. There's been a lot of talk about funding, but at this point that funding comes either out of, non of the non-98 side, which is already uh, de dealing with a strapped CSU and UC budget, or the 98 side, which is just at the same level where it was in, in um, during before the, the um, recession. External partnerships, and I could go on and on, but I have 30 seconds, so I'll wait, and hopefully there'll be a lot of questions. I'm now 30 seconds, I can't Thank you so much, Denise, I really uh, appreciate that. Um, next up is the uh, tag team duo of Ellie and So I'm going to kick us off um, to tie this conversation to the earlier panel discussions and then Ellie is going to provide you some detail about the teacher residency model as a solution to addressing the teacher shortage and it's going to provide a national picture. And then I'm going to provide an example of a local residency from San Francisco and discuss the emerging research on teacher residencies and their impact on teacher recruitment and retention. So we've heard a lot about the teacher shortage this morning. Um, we've talked about both shortages generally as well as in specific subject areas. We know that demand has outpaced supply as fewer teachers have been entering the profession. And we also know from past experience that schools and districts serving our most vulnerable students are often forced to meet these shortages by hiring teachers who have not yet completed adequate preparation. So why does this matter? So in the previous panel, somebody mentioned the issue of teacher uh, attrition. Well, in districts where turnover is higher, and they, hi and they hire um, underprepared teachers, those teachers leave at twice the rate of teachers who have gone through uh, student teaching and preparation. Similarly, teachers who don't receive early career mentoring and support in their first years leave the job at much higher rates than teachers who do. So the revolving door of teachers serves to exacerbate shortages creating a cycle in which districts hire underprepared teachers who then leave the profession in short order. In this situation, everyone loses. Students lose, their achievement is undermined by high rates of teacher attrition, as well as by their teachers lacking adequate preparation for the challenges they're facing. Schools suffer from the churn uh, as they're trying to improve, and districts pay the cost of teachers' high attrition in the range of fifteen to $20,000 so improving the quality of preparation and early career support is one really important strategy to supporting the retention of teachers. 
And these newly emerging teacher residency programs do just that. They build on the medical residency model. They offer an innovative approach to solving many of the complex problems that hard to staff districts and schools face and can support some of these regional labor market issues that were discussed earlier. The early research suggests that these programs do recruit and retain talented, diverse candidates to fill shortage subject areas and train and support them in such a way that keeps teachers in the profession at much higher rates than other models of teacher preparation. And to be clear, this isn't a model that's going to eliminate all teacher shortages or do it quickly, but they can be part of a long-term statewide strategy that recognizes and addresses the complex factors that influence teacher recruitment and retention. Because they incorporate the strongest aspects of teacher preparation and early career mentoring that we know from research work to keep talented people in the profession. So I'm going to turn it over to Ellie to talk about the specifics. Hi, um, good morning. I'm so glad to be here with all of you today on this wonderful rainy day in this very cool room um, to talk about this really important issue and to share some of the um, work that we've been doing in um, evaluating and learning more from teacher residencies. Um, so as Renita said, um, teacher residencies can be a solution to the critical teacher shortages that we've been talking about this morning. Um, and as uh, many people probably know here, especially those who are um, from districts, teacher preparation has not always done a very good job of responding to the unique needs of districts to fill um, critical shortages that they may have. Um, teacher residencies provide a local solution, a local response to meeting the needs of districts um, and providing high quality teachers who are committed to staying and working in these districts. Um, Residencies are a collaboration between the school district, between institutes of higher education, and often between um, local nonprofits. And they provide teachers with a rich clinical based uh, field experience that's supervised, it's often um, for a full year, and it provides teachers the opportunity to train in the schools which they will actually be working. And we see that. These programs are, um, while they're relatively new, are gaining quite a bit of momentum, and there's you know, over 50 uh, by our best guess at this point. So how does the residency program work? Um, it starts with very rigorous uh, selection and recruitment of residency candidates, as well as of highly effective mentors who will serve as um, supervisors and mentors for the candidates during their field work. Um, as I mentioned, the, the resident has um, a, a rigorous clinical experience, often over 1,400 hours in the classroom. Um, that's compared to a traditional program that might have somewhere between 200 and 500 hours, or alternative programs that may have as few as 40 hours. Um, while the residents are doing their field work. They're also taking master's level courses at the same time. Um, there are often stipends for them to take these courses, so um, people are able to prepare without going into um, significant debt. And the teachers are then hired, um, these candidates are then hired into these schools. When they're hired, they um, receive induction support through the program in their first couple of years. Um, so as I mentioned, we have, uh, this is a relatively new model, it's just about 15 years old. The first three residency programs started in Chicago, in Denver, and in Boston. And through our work with the National Center on Teacher Residencies, we um, now have over about 22 programs that are associated with that center. You can see they're all over the country. Um, and as I mentioned before, we've got over 50 programs that are. So what do we know from this new model? What have we learned? Well, through our work with MCTR, we're seeing improved retention as a result of uh, candidates being prepared in this way. So upwards of 85% of uh, teachers who were prepared through a residency program remain after five years. Um, I think Greg Pratt mentioned it's closer to 60% for others. We're seeing increases in student achievement for students who are taught by teachers who graduated from residency program. We see very high rates of principal satisfaction 
um, in terms of the preparation of the teachers when they enter the classroom, as well as their effectiveness. And we're seeing improved diversity of the local workforce as a function of these programs. So that provides you a bit of the kind of national picture on teacher residencies, as well as some early findings from these that we have seen in our work. And I'm going to pass it back to Renina now to talk a bit more about residencies in California more specifically.
and reducing leader demand, which is important for district schools and especially for students. We now turn it over to Mary, who's going to bring it on home with a broad perspective from the California uh, Commission on Teacher Prevention. Mary. Thank you so much. Let's see. It. It's better if you turn it on, future speakers. Uh, good morning. It's really terrific to be here with all of you and to have the chance to really dig deep on some very serious issues that are facing the state. I just want to reiterate some of the data we heard earlier. In 2013-14, the Commission on Teacher Credentialing issued 15,000 teaching credentials. That year, the Department of Education projected the need to hire, for the following year, 22,000 teachers. It's a 7,000 teacher gap between how many new uh, credentials emerged and what the projected need It will probably be tightened up, but it, it illustrates the, the significant tension that we're faced with here. Uh, we're faced with an additional tension in that there, it, the data that would tell us who actually filled those 22,000 seats, and if those were 22,000 seats in truth, and in fact, uh, is difficult to get and difficult to obtain. The department and the commission are working on how to better share the data so that we have more in-the-moment, real-time information about who gets credentialed and who gets employed so we can track that better. Uh, but the gap is significant. We've seen a 75% decline in enrollments in teacher education in the last 11, 12 years. 46% of that just in the last five years. Um, that, that creates for us in California a shallow and a shallowing bench, if you will, of teachers to serve in the, in the places that we need them to serve. It also represents, and I'm concerned about this, the potential for a deteriorating infrastructure in teacher education. I remember in 2000, 2001, uh, going on an accreditation visit to Cal State Northridge and learning that they placed every single year, roughly, between 1,800 and 2,100 student teachers. And I remember thinking, wow, that is a lot of partnership that you have to cultivate in your region. And how do you know that every single one of those placements is really a rich place for your teachers to develop? Imagine 2,000 student teachers just in one institution in California. There are under 1,000 now. So the people that were supervising and placing and developing that workforce, where have they gone? That's the infrastructure and teacher preparation that I'm a little bit worried about. I'm worried about how quickly we can jumpstart that again, despite their, their growing interest. I've, I've heard from the deans of education that there is a growing interest and an interest to participate and be part of the solution uh, to, to this problem that we're facing. But how quickly can we grow an infrastructure the infrastructure that we need, and this really creates a perfect storm for us in California, and one that we're, those of us that have been around for the last, uh, say, 25 years, remember uh, that this is not the first time we've faced this particular kind of storm. It creates some tensions for us in the policy community that I think we really need to be attentive to. The first and I think most important tension that we really all need to worry about is the one that exists between quality and quantity. The need to staff a classroom has, in our past, trumped the need to staff a classroom with a really well-prepared teacher. And that's a problem that we need to really all be focused on. As we move from great state control into local control, that introduces different kinds of creative tensions about where decisions should be made about the quality and the quantity of the workforce and where the problem lives. I'd like to see both of these tensions as dynamic tensions for us as a community. Um, and I'd like to talk a little bit about what I think our, our highest priorities have to be. I think our top priority has to be that we staff every classroom with a fully prepared and well-qualified teacher. And that we staff every school with a fully prepared and well-qualified administrator because we know what an impact that leader has on the retention of the workforce that we're trying to bring in. At the same time, I know because I've been working in this sector for a long time that the need to staff a classroom creates this tension. So we are seeing an increase in the numbers of underqualified, underprepared individuals moving into the schools. So what's critical is that while that represents a relief valve in a time of, of low supply and high demand, we have to wrap our arms around those individuals to make sure that, they can, that we can do the best we can to close the gaps that come through the door with them because of the lack of preparation and experience that they bring. Um, 
Any attempt to address a shortage has got to be multifaceted. We have to focus on recruitment. Uh, and we've done this in the past. Uh, 10, 15 years ago, the new report from the Learning Policy Institute really gives us a very nice summary of that. Uh, we had a, a scattershot approach to address recruitment, preparation growth, uh, innovation in this sector, uh, and that worked. The, the high numbers we saw of enrolled people in teacher preparation in 2003, 4, 5 were a direct result of this incredible effort to stimulate recruitment and to bring people in to, the, to this workforce. Uh, so we know that there are strategies that work. Uh, the Apple Forgivable Loan Program, the Governor's Teacher Fellowship Program, uh, those things were really, really powerful incentives to bring people in. Uh, down to 30 seconds, okay. There are program opportunities, opportunities to grow preparation at the local, uh, at the, across the state, in the undergraduate sector and in the postgraduate sector. Uh, the institutions that I'm in touch with, the deans are very interested in doing that, if we can help them afford to do that and do that in ways that will really work. Retention, another absolutely critical strategy for us to be focused on. I'm hearing as we move into local control, which has got some enormous creative opportunities for us in the state, but I'm hearing from uh, bits of directors who are serving teachers from their neighboring school district, that their neighboring school district applies a catch and release strategy. They're a high functioning school district, they're in high demand, they pay good salaries, and they don't feel the need to provide an induction program for their teachers. So their teachers have to go find induction someplace else uh, and get the, the preparation and mentoring they need to clear their credentials. This is not the direction we need to go. We need to really, I think, as a top priority, uh, reinforce that this preparation, recruitment, and development of our workforce is a joint responsibility that both higher education and our K-12 employment community share, and that we will have a stronger, better workforce if we really all get in the boat together. So, thank you. Thank you, Mary. Um, Teresa, I, I wanted to start with you with a question. Um, you hear a lot from teachers, young teachers across the state, um, before they leave as they're in their first years on the job. What are they telling you in terms of their pre-service preparation that they have been missing? Where are the holes uh, in, in the preparation uh, that you're hearing uh, most about from these young teachers that are preventing them from either sticking around or doing the best job possible? Hmm, good question. Um, it's interesting because we, I do hear from um, young teachers going into the profession and I do hear from new teachers who are already in the profession and it's kind of hard to um, separate um, some of the things that they're talking about. Um, very seldom do they approach me as, oh, this is a hole in the teacher education program that I went to. What they usually talk about is what they haven't received. And um, some of the things that they, um, they, they one of the things that, that actually came up from our workforce is um, they need emotional support, but they also need financial support. Those are the two things that they um, talk about. They talk about the lack of, um, of clinical experience. In many ways, they talk about one year is not enough for me to get to understand the schools or the communities or the complexity of public education. I wish I'd had more time. Um, in our schools um, and working not just again with classroom teachers, they lament the fact that they haven't had an opportunity to develop a relationship with the parents and community and that their relationship remains while well, I'm going to do the parent conference. Um, they talk about the fact that many of them when they're in schools, um, even those who are paraeducators, the idea that I'm working to pay tuition is no longer the reality. They're not working to pay tuition, they are working to sustain and support a family quite often. And the money that they receive um, in financial aid is not enough to do that. They go into the system and they're saddled with tremendous debt. And so they um, talk a lot about um, debt relief. The other thing that they talk about when they leave the program is, and this is probably more, um, more a factor of the lack of um, a relationship between the IHE and the district, 
They go to induction programs, many times having to pay out of pocket to go into induction programs, and will say, this is exactly the same thing I got when I was in the teacher prep program. And uh, many of them talk about how it's a waste of time, and they, the most, the most uh, important factor in their induction is the coaching they receive from other teachers. So there are a number of factors, but I would say it boils down to emotional and financial support when they're going through the program, clinical experience, um, and then also uh, the fact that they wish they could have done it earlier. So it speaks to early identification. And Ellie and Renita, the, the residency program uh, is very popular in the districts that are, are doing them, um, and as you pointed out, are, are showing uh, great initial success. I think the, the question for many districts is how do they afford this? Because it's, it's not cheap. Um, and how do they do it? Uh, obviously, in the Bay Area, for example, or in Sacramento, or, or where there's colleges and universities that they can partner with to provide that. Uh, the education that they need to go along with their um, in in school residency. Um, how can they do that when they're maybe a little more remote, uh, a little more uh, lacking access of the nonprofits and the universities? Well, I'll start off by addressing the. I'll start off by addressing the funding question. Can you guys hear me? Sure. Okay. All right. So. Um, the residency programs uh, rely on a variety of sources, uh, federal, state, district, as well as philanthropic funds. Uh, the largest source of funding right now for residencies is the um, Teacher Quality Partnership Grants under the Higher Education Act, which since 2008 have, have funded, provided millions of dollars across the country for residency programs. So that's the single largest source of funding, and then um, there's a lot of um, sharing between universities and districts. And um, there are actually a few states around the country that are starting to invest in residency programs. So just to give you some examples, uh, Texas uh, offered a competitive $1.29 million grant to Texas A&M, University of Commerce to de develop a teacher residency program. Um, Mississippi earmarked funds for loan forgiveness to graduates of teacher residency programs. And Tennessee allocated a portion of its race to the top funds to support teacher residency programs in a couple of, couple of districts. So, Right now, residency programs are cobbling together funds from different sources. Um, so, probably the you know what needs to be worked on is a more sustainable funding source beyond just grants. Uh, that's a great question, Jill. In terms of um, what we're going to do as residencies continue to develop in districts that may not have an IHE partner. And I think one option is certainly to do some online coursework, and that's something that, that could be arranged. Another could be uh, concentrated coursework, and so not um, abbreviated, certainly, but concentrated over um, a shorter period of time, over the summer, uh, or a few intensive weeks. Um, and, and I think that we will start seeing some of those creative solutions as residencies continue to develop in different places. Right now, a majority of residencies do form um, in districts that have an IAG partner uh, nearby. And so it'll, I think, a bit remains to be seen how districts that might be more isolated are going to creatively partner with IHEs. And Mary, question from the audience. Um, what is the relationship between Teach for America and other alternative pathways and the teacher shortage? Is this a problem or a solution? I think I know the answer. <laughs> well, it may be some of both a problem and a solution. When you have an inadequate supply of fully credentialed teachers, then you begin to fill your vacancies with people that are in some form of preparation and internship programs, alternative certification, and Teach for America is a large purveyor of those kinds of programs, are eligible to come in and fill those spots. Uh, so they represent a solution that's more immediate. You can immediately staff a classroom with someone who's in an intern program. The problem that presents is the, the lack of preparation that person begins with and the challenges they face as a new teacher. Uh, the numbers of them that leave uh, because nobody wants to be unsuccessful with a job this important. Uh, and the, the absolutely critical factor has to be that we provide mentoring, support, and guidance to those teachers that is immediate and right now, every week, every day, they have somebody that they're working with 
to, to prepare and to, uh, to develop their expertise. So uh, it is a relief valve, and I don't know that we'll ever not have a need for that, but we surely have come close to eradicating the need as the data that was presented this morning show. It's just going to be a growth sector, I believe, until we get an adequate supply of fully prepared teachers. Thank you. Um, you know, it occurred to me that we have, we're placing an increasing demand on teachers um, to teach the Common Core, to teach technology, to have uh, special education students in inclusion classes, um, to participate in restorative justice. Uh, there's an increasing number of newcomers with trauma. Um, it, it's a lot, and the list goes on and on. Um, I, I'm wondering how teacher education programs are keeping up with the training that's needed for teachers out there, um, and, and whether school districts have a way to track which programs are most effective in, in terms of preparing teachers. Uh, I know that is from the districts that I talk to, they have a hunch about which, which education programs are better than others, but are we seeing anything, and, and maybe Mary, you can address this a little bit, anything out there that might be able to, or Ellie, um, that might be able to help districts evaluate the best students coming out of the programs that are most prepared to tackle this very long list of requirements? Yeah, I can respond. Um, we've done quite a bit of work in Denver public schools, uh, and they have a residency program, Denver Teacher Residency, as well as many other programs, including Teach for America, they have Teach Denver Teaching Fellows, and all the traditional um, preparation programs as well. And DPS does track uh, the, the different um, candidates that they hire. Um, they do look at their preparation, they do look at principal satisfaction, they survey principals, they look at um, various outcome metrics, including teacher performance on their evaluation system, the LEAP um, data. They look at teacher performance in terms of uh, increasing student effectiveness. And so they do track that, and I think many districts are doing that as well. I can add to that. So, so that, you know, evaluation of the teaching force is very much a local endeavor in California. But that said, uh, at the licensing agency, the credentialing agency, we have a responsibility to make sure every credential we issue is issued to somebody who's earned it and who's really ready for this job. So there are a couple of different ways we attack that. One of our best uh, innovations in the last decade has been building teaching performance assessments that are authentic assessments of teaching practice during student teaching that really drill down on what it takes to be effective in the classroom. Teachers get a lot of uh, training and development just by completing and participating in that assessment, but the scores that they receive are really focused on their readiness to take their practice to the next level. So, and it also then serves as a basis for us to issue a credential to someone. So when we've issued a credential to someone to begin teaching, we know that they're ready to at least meet the minimum requirements. We have a theory also in California that that's not the end of it. There's no such thing as a classroom-ready teacher uh, exclusive of some form of support and mentoring as they enter that workforce. It's another key investment that we've had in California to invest in the development of this workforce through new teacher induction. We're also beginning uh, to explore the use and use, actually use, surveys of candidates and their employers and others uh, who are participating in their development to get a sense of how well prepared they felt and were and were found to be as they moved into preparation. That's how we're attacking this issue of quality and evaluation. So, so very quickly, I, I, um, I'd like to caution us in terms of uh, designing any teacher preparation program based just on the current reality of this. I remember the time when um, my students were saying, well, the one thing that we didn't get is we didn't get classroom management. And then we immediately went over and decided in many teacher prep programs to create a course in classroom management. Designing the teacher preparation program so that it addresses the, the hot issues of the day is only one part of it. I, I think teacher residency models do help in doing that, but this is about long-term longevity and sustainability that does not begin at the fifth year program, but that begins before they get into the pre-service program and that never ends. Um, and so it's not just teacher preparation, it's professional development, undergraduate education, 
and it's working with our schools. And that's the perfect transition to the last question that I wanted to ask. Um, it, we think of teaching as sort of a long-term commitment, that you have your pre-service, which is at least a year, and then you have mentoring, and then you have ongoing training, and uh, a, a, a lifetime career. Um, and yet, when I look at the generational outlook, and I look at the young journalists that are coming into our newsroom that used to stick around for 30 years, um, that are coming in for a few years and leaving, there's a mindset, a generational mindset, it appears to me, um, I think, was it Ellie, you called it the gig generation, that they're, they're coming into this as a gig, one of many that they will have throughout their careers, and I'm wondering, uh, what that means for the teaching profession. It's, it's sort of a very uh, philosophical, somewhat perhaps scary question for a lot of people here, but I'm wondering if that has the potential to shift um, how we think about training, uh, you know, looking at models what, that are seemingly on the uh, popularity decline, like Teach for America. Uh, what does this mean if we have a generation of people coming in that <coughs> might want to do this for some years, but not the rest of their life. I can start. Um, I think that the residencies do help to address the, the high um, mobility of this generation, in part because, uh, as Renita was explaining with the San Francisco teaching residency, the candidates commit to anywhere from three to seven years of teaching in these high needs districts. And so you've got at least some mitigation of that revolving door. And it may be that we would much prefer them to teach for 30 years and that that's just not realistic. So three to seven is often a lot better than we're seeing in other, uh, from other preparation programs. Well, and I would also add to that, in terms of the residency program, some of the initial research suggests that teachers actually stay in the profession beyond the initial commitment. So I think in that sense, once they're kind of in, they're staying. Um, it's just getting them through those early years with a lot of support um, that we've been talking about. I, I used to think, and I talked to a number of my students, I used to think that this generation looks at teaching as the mientras profession. I'm gonna do this in the meantime before I find something else. And I, I hate to put on my, my union hat, but I'm going to. Because I think part of what my students tell me is when they make a decision to go into the teaching profession, they're looking for a career in education. They want to begin their work here. They want to be able to end their work here. Will it always be as a classroom teacher? Maybe not. They want variety. They want a way to maybe leave once in a while, work as a coach, teach a university. But they look at the field of education as a career. And that's the same with journalists. I mean, I've talked to a lot of journalists who say, well, I would stay here if I had some job security, if I had some variety, if they weren't breaking the newspaper. So I think that's how we look at education. This is a field of education. And if we provide our teachers with the opportunity to be educators, then we will be able to keep them. And we pay them well, provide them job security, and all the things they need to survive, they will stay. Mary, bring it on home. Bring it on home. <laughs> I wonder how much uh, the field of medicine or law is facing this problem with the gig generation and what, because I don't, I think that someone who spent eight to ten years getting a medical license is not thinking they're going to do this for three to five years and then maybe go sell real estate. They're actually making a career commitment there. And that maybe isn't as true in education as we need it to be. But I have a young friend who just graduated at the age of 22 with a degree in nursing from Samuel Merritt College, one of the best, had two job interviews within two weeks, took an, took an offer uh, with a starting salary of $60,000. I promised to train her in every aspect of work in the emergency room and to pay for her master's degree. So the salary range for a new teacher is somewhere between $40,000 and $45,000, and the full up to about 100 to 106, depending on where you are in the state of California. But it takes like 12 to 15 years for a teacher to hit the midpoint of that range, and maybe up to 30 years to hit the six-figure salary that may be drawing them when they start in this profession. We may want to think about that uh, as, as we, you know, how we schedule the, the, you know, the movement in this profession. We may also want to think about teachers who get stuck in a place where after five years in one school district, you're not going to be able to carry your time with you if you 
decide to transition unless it's locally bargained and someone hires you with your 20 years of experience and places you there on the salary schedule. There are some systemic uh, aspects to this profession that may impede uh, its professionalism. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much uh, for the panel. Give a round of applause for this wonderful. <laughs>